problem we're trying to solve, I want to find the area under the graph of f between two points. We have two methods so far to do this. First method, we identify a region as a familiar shape, such as a rectangle or a trapezoid. Then we use our old formula to get the area. If that doesn't work, we take our region, we're going to fill it up with rectangles. We'll take the sum of the areas of those rectangles, we get an approximation for the area. Then we're going to let the triangles get finer and finer. We'll get better and better approximations. And if the limit exists, then we'll call that the area. When our function f has an antiderivative that we can compute, we're going to have a third method. So this is going to be the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Here we're going to see the connection between definite integrals and indefinite integrals or antiderivatives. So what does it state? I'm going to have a function f continuous on a closed interval a, b. We'll have an antiderivative of f. We'll call it capital F. So that just means if I take the derivative of capital F, we get back little f. The conclusion is going to be if we take the definite integral from a to b of little f with respect to x, so remember this is giving us the net area of our function between the graph of the function and the x-axis from a to b. We compute that as capital F evaluated at b minus capital F evaluated at a. Okay, and then typically we write this as this for shorthand. Now, before we get into the proofs, explaining what this means, let's go through a few examples just so we can get a feel for the mechanics. So, first example, I'm just going to use a constant function. So, we'll call f of x equal to the constant h for height. So, what do we have here? Well, if I'm over the interval going from 0 to b, okay, we have a rectangle, base is length b, height is going to be h. So, expect the area to be b times h. If we work out the definite integral using our theorem, so, if I take the antiderivative of the constant function h, we just attach an x to it. So, we're going to get h times x, then we're going to evaluate at b and 0, take the difference. So, we put in b and 0, we're going to have h times b minus 0, and I get b times h. So, this agrees with our formula for area of a rectangle. Next example, same idea, we go after a familiar shape. So I'm going to have a triangle, base has length b, height is going to be h. So the function that we're going to use, okay, it's going through the origin, straight line, slope is going to be rise over run, so it's going to be h over b. So I have f of x equal to h over b times x. Take the definite integral from 0 to b of h over b times x with respect to x. How do we take the antiderivative here? Well, this is x to the 1. So I'm going to add 1 to the exponent flip over. I get a 1 half x squared. We carry along the h over b. We're going to evaluate at b and 0 and then take the difference. So that'll give me h over b times b squared over 2 minus 0. And then out comes 1 half b times h, which agrees with our formula for the triangle. Here's a familiar example that we can't fit to a familiar shape. So we'll have f of x equals x minus 1 squared minus 1. So that's equal to x squared minus 2x. We're going to go over the interval from 1 to 3. Now, we've already seen using the limit process, if we take the definite integral, we're going to get 2 thirds. So that's going to be our net area. Some of our functions above the x-axis, some of it's below. If we use fundamental theorem of calculus, so what are we going to do? First, we're going to find an antiderivative. So here we just add 1 to the exponents, flip over. So I'll have 1 third x cubed minus x squared. We're going to evaluate at 3 and 1, take the difference. So we put in our 3, we put in our 1. Here's a really important thing to note. For these terms here, when you're working with functions with many parts, make sure you use parentheses. Okay, many of these problems have gone down in flames because we haven't put parentheses on our second term, 
that minus sign doesn't get distributed correctly. Now, when I work this out, we get back the two thirds that we were promised. Let's take this a step further and break it up into pieces. So if we draw the picture, okay, you'll note we'll have business from one to two below the x-axis. The part that's above the x-axis is gonna go from two to three. So we can work out each of these separately. So if I go from one to two, okay, we have our antiderivative already. We put in our one and two, take the difference. It's gonna give me a minus two thirds. So that's saying the signed area of the piece under the x-axis is gonna be two thirds, and then we put a minus sign because it's below the axis. Then if we work out going from two to three, we're gonna get, okay, same antiderivative. You work it out, get a four thirds. So that tells me the area of the piece that's above the x-axis. So when we add these together, we get our two thirds back. One more example using trig functions. Let f of x be equal to sine of x. Our interval is gonna go from zero to pi. So we're just gonna be looking at the area under the sine curve as so. Set up my definite integral. We need to find an antiderivative of sine of x so I can use the fundamental theorem of calculus. So what's our rule? If I take the derivative of sine, that gets me to cosine. So the idea is gonna be, if I go in the other direction, I have to throw in a minus sign. So our antiderivative is gonna be minus cosine of x. We evaluate at pi and zero, and then we take the difference. So cosine of pi is minus one, so we get a one. Cosine of zero is one, we get another one. We add them together, we get a two. So this area for this region is gonna be two. Now, to get a better idea of what's happening with the fundamental theorem of calculus, I want to restate the theorem in a way that makes no reference to antiderivatives. So what we'll do is we'll take little f, the integrand, we're going to assume it's already a derivative, so I'm going to replace it with little f prime. Now, then we'll have the condition that f prime is continuous on the interval from a to b. What are we going to do about the antiderivative? We'll note the function little f has as its derivative little f prime. So that means little f is an antiderivative of little f prime. We take those two functions, put them in the correct spots in the fundamental theorem of calculus. What comes out is going to be definite integral from a to b of f prime with respect to x is equal to little f of b minus little f of a. So you'll note two things. First off, there's no reference to antiderivatives in our statement. It's just a relation between the derivative and the function itself. And you'll also note, in a certain sense, we have integration canceling out differentiation. So if I have a derivative, we do our integral in this sense, the definite integral. What we get out is a difference of our function evaluated two points. So somehow, this integration is taking me from our derivative back to the original function. Before we prove our theorem, let's take a look at the physical interpretation. So we'll have motion in a line. So pretend you're in your car, you can only go forwards or backwards. Then we'll have little f as our position function. So it'll be a function of t for time. f prime is gonna be the velocity function. Then when I restate fundamental theorem of calculus, okay, in terms of the function and its derivative, we'll have our end position is going to be equal to our starting position plus the definite integral from a to b of our velocity function. So if you want to know the distance traveled, that's just going to be, okay, your net area under the graph of your velocity function. Now, if you're traveling at a constant rate of speed, so f prime is a constant, say it's 50 miles an hour, you drive for two hours, this is just gonna say, okay, the net distance traveled is equal to, okay, your two hours times your 50 miles an hour, which is 100 miles. So what's happening with fundamental theorem of calculus, it's telling you how to figure out your distance traveled when your velocity function is continuous, but not so simple. 
Now for our proof. So everything's gonna hinge on the mean value theorem. We review that first. The assumption we need there, which is the one we have, F prime is gonna be continuous on the closed interval from A to B. Everything we need for the mean value theorem is gonna be in this picture here. So we draw a graph of F. We're drawing the secant line that goes through AF of A, BF of B. This term here is just gonna be the slope of that secant line. So it's the rise over the run. What the mean value theorem says, somewhere in our interval, we're gonna have a point x, where if I take the tangent line to the graph of f above x, slope of that tangent line is gonna be equal to slope of the secant line. And then remember, slope of the tangent line is gonna be f prime. So f prime of x equals the slope here. Geometrically, that just means these two lines are going to be parallel. So lines with the same slope are parallel. Now, we won't use the picture in our proof the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're more interested in our ability to choose an x so that I can get this equation to hold here. So this is going to let us pull apart the Riemann sums when we do the definition for area. OK, so let's follow our nose. So the idea is going to be, I have the definite integral from A to B of F prime with respect to X. So we write out our limit definition. We're gonna have a limit of a sum of a height times a base. Now, the idea here is partition that I'm using to define my subintervals. Well, I'm just gonna take the interval AB. And we're always gonna divide it into N equal length subintervals. So the delta X is always gonna be the same depending on the end that we're looking at. But to use the mean value theorem, I'd rather write it as a difference of two endpoints. So if our partition looks like A, X sub one, all the way up through X sub N minus one, and then B, we're gonna write this as X sub I minus X sub I minus one for the ith rectangle. Then the mean value theorem says, we could always choose some point in that interval so that we get this to hold. And here we replace A and B with X sub I minus one and X sub I. So you'll note if I push this to the other side, what does that say? It'll say that our derivative times this length of an interval, okay, that's that times that, is gonna be equal to our function evaluated at the endpoints. So the mean value theorem lets you push, okay, your derivative to a difference of your function at the endpoints. So we go from here to here. Now you'll note, if we take the sum of all of these differences, well, things are gonna telescope, meaning all the terms in the middle are gonna disappear, and I'll just be left with the terms on the end. So that'll be f of b minus f of a. So if you take a look, okay, I'm gonna go backwards. So the first term is gonna be over here. Okay, well that first subinterval is gonna be a to x1. And then we do the difference when we apply f to both of those. So it's f of x1 minus f of a. Okay, we keep going and going and going. The next to last one is gonna be f of x sub n minus one minus f of x sub n minus two. Last term is f of b minus f of x sub n minus one. And then you'll note this term cancels in a pair. Then this one will cancel in a pair. And then everything cancels in a pair except for this minus f of a and our f of b. So that gets us to our answer. So what's happening here, mean value theorem lets you push each of your results on these subintervals to their endpoints, and then everything in the middle collapses except for your f of a and your f of b. So that's a big idea that's gonna show up over and over again. So we get the multivariable calc, it'll show up as Stokes theorem, which we call baby Stokes theorem. And then if you ever make it to grad work, you'll see the real Stokes theorem. As a final note, how do we ever guess that this theorem's true? In our proof, the key step was to reinterpret the mean value theorem. Now, the mean value theorem is very believable. On our previous board, we had a picture, there's just two lines. The conclusion was their slopes are equal. So we had slope of the tangent line equals the slope of the secant line. Now, if we multiply both sides by B minus A, we can reinterpret. Then we have the change in F over the interval AB is equal to this product. 
this product we can reinterpret as an area. So this is going to be when A and B are very close, so B minus A is very small. It's going to be the area under the derivative of F above the interval AB. So when A is very close to B, that gives us our connection between the area under the derivative and the change in F. Now, the fundamental theorem of calculus says that relation persists in the large. So you can think of the fundamental theorem of calculus as a global version of the mean value theorem.